All right, mm. this is Giles Edwards talking to you right now for 366 Weird Movies, and I am seated with director, actor, writer, I think I saw editor, producer, and uh, pretty much all the little uh, behind camera and in front of camera titles one can hope for, Larry Fessenden whose film Blackout had its international premiere last night. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm just fine. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I'm going to admit from the get-go that I had to deal with a little issue with my lodging this morning, so I'm less prepared than I'd like to be. So <laughs> you can feel free to go on whatever tangents you care to about uh, whatever crosses your mind concerning this. Love it. So I guess I'll start with a, a broad question here in regards to Blackout specifically. How did this movie start? You know, the inception of the story, the uh, pursuit of who's doing what on screen and behind, and uh, maybe like a brief reiteration of your spiel from last night talking about the, the sort of family that you uh, have accrued over your years in independent cinema. Well, where to begin? No. So, uh, look, I have a company called Glass Eye Picks. We've been around since 1985, although the truth is uh, uh, sort of gathering momentum in the 2000s. I've worked with a lot of young filmmakers in my capacity uh, as a cheerleader for independent film. I mentored people like Ty West and Kelly Reichert, Jim Mickle over the years. So it is my mission to get people off their ass to make movies rather than talk about it or fantasize about funding them with uh, fancy actors and so on. So that is how we've made a number of remarkable, very small films. And I'm very glad to say that there's some fans who know of our work. Uh, meanwhile, I'm also a director trying to tell stories. My specific angle is that I grew up loving the old black and white horror movies. Um, and then sort of in the 70s, when I was 12 or 13, I became more enamored with uh, the so-called realism of Martin Scorsese and that sort of more gritty, naturalistic social realism that you see. And I wanted to somehow blend these two loves of my life. So I ended up starting on a career making, um, so to speak, realistic horror films, personal horror films. I started with a movie called Habit, which is a vampire story about an alcoholic and is his girlfriend a vampire or is he really just losing his mind is sort of the central question. And I went on to make some other films. I made a series of movies about the Wendigo, which uh, I adore that uh, mythology. And then I circled back and made a film called Depraved, which is a modern Frankenstein. Yeah, I thought that. It, it takes place in Brooklyn. You know, yep. that was the conceit. And that was in the time of, uh, we were ensnared in the Iraq war, and so it was about PTSD. And the question was, and this is leading to the answer to your question, how do we update the Frankenstein story? Uh, who would be a doctor of that amount of skill that we associate with Dr. Frankenstein? You know, how would he be that skilled? And uh, it led me to think, well, if you were a battlefield uh, surgeon, uh, medic, you might know how to bring people back from the dead. In fact, I did read several books that indicated, uh, you know, some of the new techniques out in the field. So I created this modern Frankenstein and it had many thematic iterations, all borrowed or adapted from Miss Shelley herself, uh, bless her heart. Uh, and finally, uh, all the while, love werewolves and Wolfman, Wolfman in particular. And so it seemed logical to continue the mission of sort of thinking about how do these uh, stories resonate in today's world. And the werewolf being sort of a dual character, of course, he's a nice fellow half the month and then uh, gets into trouble at night during the full moon. I thought, well, that's a divided personality. And that led to thinking about our nation, which unfortunately is increasingly divided. And why is it divided? Well, because of misinformation. So you see, that's how I write and I started conceiving of a town that would be suffering as our nation does from different factions warring each other and all the while in the center of it a man who has sort of got two sides to him. And so I conceived of uh, the storyline of Blackout, I wrote it and then I gathered a very humble uh, 
crew because I wasn't willing to spend the 10 years to not get the budget, which is what I just did for Depraved. Oh, okay. uh, I had um, some famous people attached at one point, and that seemed like it would lead to money, and then they would drop out, and you know, it would just, it's a cycle of yearning that I, I'm getting too old now to entertain anymore. So I'd rather make a cheap film, and I was lucky enough to be able to find enough money to make a cheap film. I know that's not easy in itself. Film is an expensive habit, but... Uh, <laughs> So that's my story. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so I get misinformation stemming from what I guess I'd say lack of comprehension, <laughs> which falls very nicely with the Wolfman as lamented by the main character in your yeah. film. He doesn't understand what the other element is doing and even, you know, uh, anything that's going on within that uh, right. mindset. So definitely a good capture. And of course, uh, nicely uh, encapsulated by the competing yard sign opening montage bit where, you know, it's, uh, it, it, you, you have a certain number of views that you wear on your sleeve, and I, I think it's a credit to you that you mm -hmm. kind of showed those up front. Yeah. Because you had your wonderful little throwback horror introduction showing, hey, I'm an old-timey horror guy, and then you had your, uh, shall we say, social agenda was uh, just sort of put out there in a nice... Efficient yep. little five minute drive while yeah. uh, some background was done. So that was uh, something I quite like. Yeah. And um, I, I try to see a lot of uh, lower budget movies is uh, how they're going to harness an efficiency of storytelling so mm -hmm. that they can still have time to dwell on the particulars that they're uh, hoping to explore there. So. Uh, I guess since uh, I'm talking to a versatile individual such as yourself, and I mentioned that uh, there's the acting, the writing, and directing, and I'm not going to ask you which is favorite because I'm sure they're all very different experiences, mm -hmm. but if you might speak briefly on the particular joys and maybe drawbacks uh, or disappointments that you find in each of those three roles that you've uh, partaken in yeah. throughout your career. Well, uh, just let's talk about making a movie. So, of course, the writing is a is a wonderful, versatile time. You're alone, which I actually like. <laughs> um, and then you um, are fairly free. I mean, if you've produced enough movies, you might be slightly aware of what is a, uh, an extreme, but an extreme choice. But I don't think that way. In fact, I encourage people not to think that way. We've made crazy period pieces. We've filmed in um, Staten Island, an old British BBC style uh, grave robbing movie. The point is, is that my friend who brought me this script, Glenn McQuaid, uh, I, it was never a question. I, whereas often you're told, make a movie in one house, you know, with three characters. And that can be great too, House of the Devil isn't so bad. But uh, I don't like to make that the parameter under which you can make an indie or low budget film. In any case, the writing should be a place of freedom, and it's a wonderful thing. Now directing is only wonderful because now you have new collaborators, and that's hopefully actors that can bring your writing to life and, and, and you know your DP who has ideas, although I'm a very controlling filmmaker and I appreciate you mentioning the signs because yeah, these are the sorts of images that I just bake into the script and um, I write with the shots in mind. So directing is often disappointing because you see the vision slipping away for reasons. I don't want to blame budget for everything. You can have enough money to get the scene and you still have problems. There's, um, you know, literally fate interfering and sometimes fate offers you things that are wonderful, you know, whether it's a windstorm or rain or, a, or some great lighting, but fate can also be a, a bummer. Yes, yeah, like you mentioned that uh, stream picture where you had your uh, artist on hand to go out and uh, yes. do your directorial bidding in, uh, <laughs> yes. in, in all manner of unpleasant uh, temperature. Exactly. But then editing is where you bring it together. And this is not my idea, it's been said before, but you make the movie three times, once in the writing, once in the directing, and then finally in the edit, and that edit is the movie. The others uh, are merely chasing phantoms, uh, but the edit is what the audience will see. And I would like to point out that then there's the sound, and mm -hmm. I take a great deal of comfort in um, yeah. the sound, because you can tell whole other stories. I like to say there's one picture, there's 24 or 70 sound effects and soundtracks. There's obviously music, but there's different winds, 
There's tonal elements. There's crickets. You can play those crickets oh, backwards. Yeah. You can get under people's skin, and they don't know why. So that's a wonderful thing. And then you have the score. So, look, I love the art form. Oh, you can tell. Uh, it's just tell. all of it is fantastic. Yeah, I definitely understand the sound issue. I'm an amateur uh, narrator and sound storyteller myself. Well, I can and tell and by your uh, dulcet tones. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so over the past couple of years, I myself have been exploring the uh, various things you can do just exclusively in sound since I don't work in uh, video myself. But, yes. Uh, so, well, yeah, may I please plug Tales from Beyond the Pale, which is our uh, podcast, 50 unique audio dramas. Well, set to chill you to the very bones. Well, may I and plug my own efforts with uh, various narrations I've done of Poe and Lovecraft, put to uh, score by a couple uh, anar uh, four or five anarcho-leftist Canadian musicians that I randomly met on the internet one That's day. That's fantastic. I will look you up. And furthermore, you must listen to Mask of the Red Death, which is our only foray into an adaptation. It's a reading, I should say. But I did the score on the saxophone, oh, nice. uh, so you might get a good And I've done a reading of Mask of the Red Death, working with these Canadians who did the Fantastic. score. Fantastic. We shall so, exchange pose. That's okay. wonderful. And uh, I have no idea how much time I've got. You have a, a good uh, four or five minutes. All there. right. Four or five minutes. A lot can happen in four or five minutes, <laughs> I can assure you. Well, let me see. Oh, yes, there were a couple uh, hints at the start and end bit last night about your uh, affiliation with the Fantasia Mafia. Now, obviously, uh, you're, you're, you're the kind of director you are, and Fantasia is the kind of festival it is, so, you know, I know why these uh, stars would align here, but if you might elaborate briefly on your uh, history with Fantasia and how you uh, seem to have uh, sunk further and further in with this uh, crew here. It's a uh, motley unsavory crew well it all comes down to mitch davis who is just such a uh, fantastic figurehead to the festival the level of enthusiasm and yes. in-depth <laughs> knowledge of the genre and, and all of its iterations is inspiring and that's what you want uh at a, at a genre festival i i love genre people most of all even though as i say i feel like i'm slightly outside the genre because my films are a little bit uh, sleepy but um, nevertheless, this is a wonderful uh, genre, and, and the, you know it's all filled with horror and death and dread. But in fact, I find the community very, very warm. And I think it's because if you're preoccupied with death, it's because you're aware that this is a precious few moments uh, yeah. on this uh, mortal coil. So I do love uh, the horror and fantasy genre and all the people who love it too. And uh, I've had several of my own films here, but also as a producer, I've presented many f other films. So I've, I've traveled to Canada more than, at least I would say a half dozen times for Fantasia. And I've also been here promoting work. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing we did at Frontiers was indeed produced. Uh, that's Jen Wexler's film, and really? she's about to show a movie this next week. So it's a wonderful festival, it's a wonderful institution. And they, damn, they have good graphics. Look at that little fox. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, bolt change from the... Uh, Doesn't get better. The, the Pegasus and uh, yes. dog thing that had dominated for years. I remember years. the Pegasus was um, also beloved. Yeah, you mentioned uh, traveling to Canada. You also mentioned upstate New York. I'm from a slice of upstate oh, New really? York myself. Do tell. Uh, 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 Troy, New York. Oh, uh, just, uh, oh, it's, it's just Speaking of mythology. What a name. Oh, indeed. And <laughs> there was a point further back in its history where it kind of lived up to that uh, grandeur. But once, um, certainly once shirt collars became a, a non-item uh, for production reasons, uh, things <laughs> fell off a bit there. But uh, it's a great, great little city. What uh, part of upstate New York? You probably call it downstate. Well, We're near Kingston. Oh, okay. That's and Woodstock is the hamlet that I'm sort of referencing yeah, in my movie, although we call it Talbot Falls. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because I, I noticed, yeah, there's a, a wonderful time of year weather that I noticed with all the made in New York movies. Like, yeah, that's, that's yeah. you know, everywhere outside of New York City, you're going to see that kind of yeah. damp, green, yeah. harsh sunlight in uh, fall or spring or winter kind of that's thing. That's right. 
And I've made several films up there, including Wendigo, which is a winter movie, and that's very uh, atmospheric. That was when we had snow before the climate took yes, a turn. Yes, we, we now have more of a rainy season than... Uh, now we have what we know as a wintry mix, winter, which is a metaphor yeah, for we are fucked. Although I guess there, there might be some hope in that, uh, at least in the up, greater upstate New York, we'll be uh, troubled a little later than virtually every other well, part of the Well, that's the hope. Is there any wood to knock on? Uh, I guess, well, we got some laminate space. here. Oh, some the laminate. Yeah. <laughs> That'll get us halfway. <laughs> and uh, I imagine since my, my time is probably running out, uh, and we are just talking about your hometown, one question we like to close on at 366 oh, wow. is, uh, can you recommend a restaurant in your hometown for our listeners to investigate if they find themselves in that part of the world? Uh, it's funny you mention it. I rarely leave the house when I'm upstate. There's some good bars and restaurants, but I usually cook at home. It's something I look for. So should they come and visit you? So they should probably try to contact me and I'll happily make them some uh, salmon on the grill or something of that nature. Oh, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> I think that's our first home cooking recommendation in the Indeed. seven years I've been doing this. <laughs> so that's alright. So check out uh, Fessenden's place. Shay Fessenden. Shay Fessenden <laughs> and uh, you will be uh, treated to delightful grilled salmon and I'm sure other <laughs> yes. homemade That's delights. Right. Mm -hmm. Garden grown no less. Oh well, <laughs> garden grown salmon is, is everyone's favorite. So well, I guess that just about wraps things up because of time constraints, although I'm sure we could sit here and talk for I a good bit can. longer. Hopefully we'll We'll uh, meet again. Meet as again they say. and uh, cross paths on the interweb, as they say. So I uh, yeah, wrap up here by saying thank you very much, Larry Fessenden. Everyone, be sure to check out Blackout. Any quick plugs for an upcoming project? I know there are complications in the world. Yeah, that's right. No, not a word. Mum's the word. Mum's Let's the get word. Through this so, strike. But right now, there's Blackout. It opened yesterday, which means it's got a long stretch of future ahead of it for you to find, I'm sure, at some point, streaming and otherwise. So, thank you again, sir. Very good. Thank you, sir. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce to the stage, once again, one of the great independent American storytellers, Larry Fessenden! <laughs> summer camp today. Well, here we are. Uh, let's be brief. Thanks so much mm -hmm. to Fantasia, always. Uh, long history here, and um, we've got new films mounted with uh, Frontiers. That's enough for me. You're going to have to sit through the movie. Do you want to explain it about the monster film? Certainly not. We'll talk later. <laughs> if they like it, we'll talk. Otherwise, thank you for coming. Uh, let's just get on it. And thanks, Mitch. Thanks to Fantasia. And to our hostesses. <laughs> and there's a lot of team here as well. Yeah. So thanks for everybody who's putting this together. Let's get on with it, man. All right. <laughs> We have some other members of your team with us as well. Please introduce them. Yeah. Oh, don't make me remember everyone's name. Uh, but uh, my crew is here. If you guys want to come down, let, we just can hang out. Yeah. Uh, thanks, all of you who made the trek. My DP, my producers. Uh, come on down. Start, Larry. Uh, Talbot Falls. Really? You had to go there, Talbot Falls? Yeah, man. 
trying to have some fun. <laughs> but uh, but seriously, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, kind of the third part in the trilogy. Move down, move down, everyone. Uh, kind of the third part of the trilogy. You started when, you, of course, the film that made your name, Habit, was a vampire movie. Your previous film to this was your Frankenstein yep. movie, and now your werewolf movie. Uh, you obviously someone who has great respect for classic horror literature and classic horror films. But it's a very contemporary, all these films are very contemporary. Uh, the one thing that I thought was interesting was, Habit was a New York City movie, Depraved was a, a Brooklyn movie, this is upstate. Why not a werewolf in Manhattan or a werewolf in Queens? Why indeed, let's do that next. Uh, no, I mean, I don't know, everything, uh, for one thing, depraved moves upstate for what it's worth. That's so true. I am of two minds, and Habit has a seminal scene in, in Long Island in the country. Uh, you know, because who doesn't love a nice creaky tree or a, a full moon out in the, um, in the countryside? But uh, this just came to me, it seemed to be about a small town. Um, uh, it would be fun to make a werewolf movie for the city, but that's a... That's another story. We've had werewolves in London. We've had werewolves yes, we in have. Washington. And Why Paris, I think. And Paris. No, we try to forget that one. But Why not? I mean, granted, we had Wolfen. Oh, yeah, that's great. That's a classic so, New York City werewolf. Didn't I mean, love but, the yeah. wolves, but I loved uh, Albert Finney. Uh, but now, you, you mentioned that uh, uh, you, sp you live in upstate New York part of the time. Yeah. And this is a movie that's very much about a town. Yeah. It's not specifically about, it's, you know, it's a crossbreed of a lot of different small town characters. Uh, having issues with your neighbors? No, we all get along. <laughs> but seriously, uh, was that, I mean, and this is also to the, the topicality of it, yeah. uh, about immigration and about all the mistrust and everything mm -hmm. that goes along with uh, neighbors and environmental concerns work their way into it. So, I mean, just for you, was this a matter of you just had all these themes, you wanted to take them all together and you wanted, and you figured, oh wait a minute, this works for my for my werewolf movie, or was it a werewolf movie first, and then everything else came about? Uh, I wanted to make a werewolf movie, and uh, when I approached these old, almost tired cliches, I'm very influenced by the literally the Universal movies from the 30s and 40s. You sort of wonder, well, what what is the essence of this monster? If you make a Frankenstein movie, it's about waking up not knowing who you are. It's about uh, the Frankenstein dilemma. Is like, why was I born? Those sort of things. And then, if you're trying to make a modern understanding of these old themes, uh, it leads in a certain way. This is my process. So I'm making a werewolf movie, and that's of course about a divided personality. I mean, it's sort of a, a Jekyll and Hyde type of story, except it doesn't have the deliberateness of that, nobody's drinking a potion. This is technically a curse, or so I saw it. But really the idea of the divided personality, and that leads to the idea of a divided town, and that leads to the idea of a divided nation. Gee, I wonder why I would think about that. So it all seemed to me very organic to back to the, the specifics of the monster. So I, what, I, what I like to do is find, not deliberately to torture my audience, but to connect uh, contemporary themes to these wonderful old archetypes. And um, and that's really my agenda. What's what I, I, I want to show how these stories still have great uh, life and relevance. And so that's sort of where it came from. I do live upstate. I, I love my community. Um, and I wanted to do a portrait of that rural setting. Uh, also, as I'm funded less and less, uh, I have to work with what's around me, and uh, I was able to gather a bunch of um, like-minded people, these wonderful people who helped make this film, and also to involve the community. And I'd go to the guy that I've been buying $40 plants from and say, can I film in your greenhouse? I think you owe me, because <laughs> the deer have eaten everything I ever bought at your place. So, you know, it was about community. And I, I like, I think, in these times, it's nice to reiterate community in your process and then, of course, in the story itself. So those are some of the things that led to this peculiar picture. So this is my producer, uh, Chris Ingridson, and he is a fellow who uh, has access to cars and guns and great know-how. He's been making independent movies longer than I have, and so 
this is an essential part of my team. And then uh, my DP uh, worked with my son previously, and we I just sort of saw the, we were all sort of in the trenches together there. Uh, uh, maybe you guys can introduce yourselves. These are our costume uh, ladies. Um, and all of these people I've worked with in one capacity or another. So it was about building a very communal team, everybody kind of knowing my style because I produced my son's film and I was sort of borrowing uh, the way that was made because we made it upstate as well. So um, just introduce yourselves and say what you did. Michelle Lee's costume designer. Gabby Lehner, I was the co-producer on Blackout. Maddie Araldi, I did props, set dressing, some extra work, graphics, and I found the Volvo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eugene Leonard, uh, I did a lot of blood and computer effects stuff. Uh, I'm John Valley, I'm the director. <laughs> well, they're all acting very shy, but thank you. You can't make a movie like this without uh, the camaraderie. Um, and the sort of the can-do spirit, and that's what uh, that's what the interviews were comprised of. Very brief interviews, as I recall. But just, uh, can you do it? Will you do it? Um, but we, we, I think we had a pretty good time. By the way, Gabby had come to me. She'd never worked uh, for or with my company, but she had a, an affection for horror, and she had tracked down Jen Wexler, who used to be a producer at Glass Eye Picks, and. Um, who has a, by the way, her film, yes. Sacrifice Game, is world premiering here uh, a next week. week from tomorrow. Week from, yeah, so we check tomorrow, that so out. Yes. In the hall. And, you know, that's part of, uh, you know, I'm speaking about community, but it's also a community of filmmakers, and, you know, we bring new people into the fold. Of course, in this case, it means getting somebody who's uh, not yet ready <laughs> or who uh, doesn't know what they're getting into. But Gabby was incredible, and uh, we're so appreciative to have new blood, and she helped uh, put this together. I obviously you saw the movie, so there's like 30 actors and we had all these scheduling issues. People would come in just for two days, but that meant Airbnbs and someone had to change the uh, sheets. I mean, this is the practicality of making a Well, let's, a let's also, let's, you talk about actors, let's talk about Alex Hurt, uh, yeah. who is your lead and of course is the anchor of the film. Yeah. You, had you worked with him before? Was he in any previous class? I well, once again, this movie is, speaking of vampirism, I was a uh, vampiring over all my old projects. And in this case, uh, my son Jack uh, found Alex Hurt through Lois Strapkin, uh, my casting agent, and also Jack's on his uh, film Foxhole. Alex was in the Foxhole, one of the five or six actors that uh, Jack cast for his movie. And when I was on the set as the producer, um, I started talking to Alex and he said he loved acting because of the old Universal Horror movies. And then also, I don't know if it's clear to you guys, but his father is William Hurt, the famous 80s actor. Uh, Academy Award winner. Yeah, iconic actor from, I don't know, Broadcast News. And History, of History of Violence. And of course, uh, several Marvel movies, should be said. Is that true? Yeah, he's Thunderbolt Ross. I don't even know that. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> anyway, he used to be uh, <laughs> a man of quality. Uh, but, but I think he was a tough dad. And so talking to Alex about fathers and alcoholism and a lot of other things, I realized this guy is um, deeply melancholy, caring, damaged, and fully engaged. And he's a great actor. He's great in uh, Jack's film. So I said, you want to be my werewolf? And you know, this is it's these little steps that help you uh, make a film. Uh, by the way, uh, another step was I decided the character should be a painter. I think it's maybe because my son was painting at that time, but I always knew I wanted the idea of like an artist in society is already kind of an outsider. And then, you know, from there you are at one with nature and from there you're a werewolf and murdering people. But, um, but oddly I got an email out of the blue one year uh, prior to this film. Uh, from a painter from Brooklyn, and he just wanted to paint my portrait. And it happened to be that he uh, takes a shine to certain personalities that he encounters, and he liked my films. Uh, John Mitchell is here. Where is John? There he is. So John painted my portrait. And uh, I asked him, as time went on, if he would consider being involved in this movie, which meant, will you paint me, you know, 
30 or 40 paintings or can I cannibalize your work and can we talk about it? And, and we had wonderful long emails back and forth. John was so excited and engaged in you know the mythology and the artistry of, of, of uh, all of this. So there again, another collaboration that starts to build uh, a movie and that's how I find the film. And I should also ask about the, there's the animated sequence. Yeah. Was that was he part of that or I did not want to torture John. That is another uh, crazy person that I love, whose name is James Seward. He is um, he was the DP on my film uh, Depraved, and he's worked at Glass Eye, my little company Glass Eye Picks for many years. Um, and he's a maniacal animator, and he won't. Everything has to be handcrafted, and so he <coughs> painted three hundred paintings for that section you see. It took him seven months. Uh, so I wouldn't put John through that. I had John on the other. I had John out in uh, the stream. I so suddenly was like, oh, John, I'd love to cut to a painting of a stream. Uh, can you just hop out there? It was, it was November or something. He's out there, you know, painting the stream. Uh, so it's, um, I have a team of experts working. Also, Eugene, everybody spoke so quietly down there, but Eugene did a lot of the cleanup work. This is obviously a very, you know, practical film, and you know, everybody's putting on the makeup and the fur is falling off and all of that, but then you can get Eugene to fix it. <laughs> you can put a little extra blood or, um, I don't know what else we did, we shouldn't talk about it, but um, he, he, uh, he did some great cleanup work. So it was great, once again, these seminal people helping uh, build the movie. And uh, I'm gonna ask one more question, to take it out to the audience. Uh, of course, the film ends with a bit of a little tease of perhaps a Larry Fessenden <laughs> universe, dark universe, Larry Fessenden style. What can you tell us about that? Well, there's six people. I really appreciate it. There was a tiny gasp from three <laughs> people that <laughs> seen my movies. <laughs> uh, but the end is, um, in the, and I don't credit Marvel, they, they've done it before then, but whatever those are called. Well, yeah, Universal, movies. of course, had the crossovers. For well, years. yes, but I'm just saying the whole idea, you have to sit to the credits to see something. Notice I shoved mine quite close to the uh, yeah. end, but that's the Frankenstein from my previous movie that mm -hmm. he sees, and so that. Well, who here, who here saw the print? I mean, it played here. It, several people. So what? Well, those are my family, and then there's. <laughs> 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 okay, I'll take it. But uh, the point is, is of course I'm teasing out. Um, I, it's it's not a huge secret, but I intend to do a mashup. I'm going to have all my monsters in the next movie, and uh, I've told all my pals that was the intention. So we'll see, we'll see. I and we'll see it here. We hope. Well, I, I'll have to keep buttering Mitch up. It's exhausting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Gotta yeah. Send him a Christmas card. That's yeah. really hard. Oh, oh yeah. First day, the whole thing. Yeah, it's going to be twisting his heart. <laughs> I, I hope so. Happen. It would be fantastic. Do you guys have questions? Larry Fessenden is here. We just world premiered his movie. Do you have questions for Larry? <laughs> yes, gentlemen, right here. Thank you. Question about the design of the werewolf. So the werewolf is just done by uh, Peter Gerner and Brian Spears. They're makeup guys that I've worked with since the early 2000s, and they did my Frankenstein. Um, and uh, my main agenda was to have a flat-faced human form werewolf. Uh, we very briefly talked about the extended legs, but for budget reasons, and I've done that with my Wendigo, which was a total failure, so I was just, I, I ultimately felt that when I learned of um, Alex's commitment physically, you see how buff he is, all of that was work that he did. Uh, obviously, he's a fit guy, but he really went, you know, the diet and the whole thing, and all this neurotic drinking of potions, and, you know, all that. So uh, I'm so appreciative of that that I didn't want to, like, them have put on like a first suit. So we actually started pairing away. But the initial thing was, uh, I'm a huge fan of Mike Plug's drawing for Werewolf by Night, which is in fact a Marvel property from the mm. 70s. I grew up on that. And turned into a movie. Uh, so they say, I haven't seen it, I'm sure it's great. I went to Miramax <laughs> in the 90s and I begged them to make Werewolf by Night and they said, we thought you were some independent guy. I said, that's because I can't get out of independent jail. Let me make this movie. Anyway, it didn't happen. But uh, I always wanted to follow the 
Lon Chaney tradition, which of course mm -hmm. has carried on, you know, all the way to Monster Squad, and uh, you know, I have obvious respect for American Werewolf in London and Dog Soldiers and Howling, but the Snout Werewolf um, always seemed like a slightly different thing. Maybe it was a werewolf, but I wanted to make a wolf man. So, uh, uh, yeah, so that's the deal, and um, worked with Brian and Peter, and that's where we, we landed. And we ended up feeling like, you know, we just didn't need a lot of fur. It's also a psychological movie. All my movies are saying, is it really, is this guy really a werewolf, or has <laughs> he just got a lot of problems? And so I like that coming through. Uh, I have to say, you know, typically you, you say in this day and age, you go, oh man, you know, a werewolf transformation. What can you do to a werewolf transformation that's new? And you found something new, transforming behind the wheel of a car. <laughs> and so let's let's get into just that sequence and getting, you know, shooting that sequence and designing it and, and pulling it off. Because uh, it is still, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive, not just as a werewolf transformation sequences, but as a car crash too. Yes, well, Chris, did I say guns and uh, what else did I say? But also cars. So we found a hill. It's not as easy as you think. You know, usually if a hill is enough to go over, there's a fence or a guardrail. So it was a pain in the ass. Chris found it uh, in his neck of the woods. Yeah, and it was, you know, it wasn't uh, exactly a car stunt going off a ramp or something like that. It was more of a gentle going off the road. So. <laughs> You know, we prepped the car and then pushed it with a skid steer. We found a perfect hill for that. And then, as you can see in the sequence editorially, then it gets flipped over and the skid steer does it again. So it was, you know, a very practical stunt, but it worked and it worked very well, very well cut. And to Chris's credit, he showed me several cliffs. <laughs> and I was like, dude, the whole point is it's supposed to be like, Wah, wah. The guy's a werewolf. He doesn't know how to drive. He kind of goes over a ridge and he flips the car. And then chaos ensues because of the Good Samaritans get yeah, the shit end of that stick. So it wasn't supposed to be about, uh, I'm not going to compete with Fast and Furious, not at this budget. Yeah. So that was the, and I know Chris was at first like, oh, well, come on, man, look at this cliff. But uh, it would have just been a whole other thing, which would have been cool, but uh, maybe for the mashup. Yeah. Um, we're going to have a little more fun in the mashup, I have a feeling, because it's so preposterous. Um, yeah, but the, so those are often my choices, is to sort of lean into the realism and not make it quite the movie moment, but try to find another texture. Uh, so that was the idea. And, and we did it. We had lots of different approaches in terms of we had a that beautiful red light from uh, Collins Gaffer and that was done just on in the front yard you know people shaking the car but then we had some poor man's trailers so you know you you design it the way I like to make films is uh, it's all designed in advance so we have marching orders and then you can loosen up from there you know uh, find some spontaneity but you you at least have you have any more questions right here uh, it was mentioned I'm going to use all of you. I'm going to start recycling now. I'm too old to come up with anything new. No mummy movie, Larry? This is the thing. Everyone says mummy movie. Why well, did they come the, up with the okay, mummy movie? Invisible Man, then. How about that? Now, there's a picture. Okay, I'll make it that. If you're, if you're following the classic universal, you know, I playbook, never, you never could. Loved well, mummy. Are they gonna Are they gonna meet Abbott and Costello as well? No, I'm not gonna sit here and be abused by this fucking guy. Which is <laughs> actually a great movie, by the way. It's one of the best, absolutely. <laughs> and well, sadly, often most people's first encounter with all the Universal monsters, it's uh, it's all and either that or it's Young Frankenstein. I'm like, yeah. where's the seriousness here, people? No. And yeah, it's one. Of, it really is one of the great films. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I enjoy it. Yeah, and Invisible Man is in that, right? Very briefly. Isn't that the, yeah. uh, the punchline? Yeah, that's, that's very really. You guys, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, You're right here. And then in the back. If you do the mashup, does that mean Mary Beth Snyder is going to come out of retirement and come back to play her role? That's a great question. My uh, So this film habit I made in 1994, it played here in 97, took a long time uh, to 
get that made and so on, but uh, has this actress who was my co-star and she played the vampire and she's really fantastic and mysterious and the best thing about it is she never acted again. So she has this amazing aura. People look her up and they're like, what happened? Was she a real vampire? All the wonderful possible things. <laughs> sort of like Shadow of the Vampire, that uh, conceit that the guy in mm. you know, Nosferatu was a real vampire. So uh, I don't have the answer. Uh, I've seen her since, she's lovely. But, um, but I may have to play the vampire, so we'll <laughs> figure it all out. In back. Uh, yeah, was there ever a draft in the script or a cut where you actually find out who the wolf man was that changed him in the first place? Oh, I thank you for that. And and I, somebody was also asking the two werewolves. Mm. I did have, we used to call him the OG werewolf, the guy that's sort of flashing occasionally, and then you see him at the end. So who was that? Um, someone today had such a fantastic, I did like these Zoom interviews, and they had a theory that was so special that I had to chuckle and realize, oh, I guess it isn't clear. And I'm not saying that I have an answer, but I kind of have my own notion. Mm. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you, but I love what that guy thought. He thought it was Barbara Crampton. <laughs> you guys all get the, the, the. We'll share whatever awards I get. We're going to share with that because that's brilliant. Oh my God. I have to say, I was reminded of. It was a picture that you produced, although you produced it for another company, but you did a werewolf movie about 10 years ago called Late Phases. Oh, yes. Great movie. Which had a great werewolf in it as well. And yeah. I was kind of reminded of that werewolf, and I'm thinking, is he tying in the Late Phases? But it's like. <laughs> Yeah, Marvel's got nothing on me, man. I'm going to no, make every movie not. I ever made is going to be kind of glass eye <laughs> universe. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I do recommend Late Phases for anybody who likes werewolf movies. It's, it's unique uh, because it's about um, an old folks home, and they're all werewolves. So it's really <laughs> bananas, and we have uh, the cast is lovely. People like from uh, Gilligan's Island, you know. Italy's these, and yeah, old times. And it, it starred another actor who you worked with many times, Nick Dimitri. Nick Dumici and uh, Tom Noonan, who's in some of uh, the, the House of the Devil, and obviously he's in real movies, but he's in some of our movies. <laughs> uh, we've got time for Andy in the back. Um, did you ever talk with Alex about altered states? I don't know how many father-son transformation actor duos there are ever. <laughs> I love that, and of course we talked about it, and we joked about it. Uh, if anybody knows Altered States, uh, I mean, is he a werewolf? He's certainly a, a like in the pit, a, yeah, a, a, a furry creature, yeah. um, and uh, the, that's just a seminal sequence. So yeah, we we joked about that for sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got there. You go in front. Very lucky. I've worked with most of the people in the movie. Although I want to say we've found some newcomers. I love the sheriff uh, Joseph Midyet. He was new to me. Uh, Ella Ray Peck, who's the fantastic cop who tells the funny story about Umwelt. Uh, she's uh, she's in a friend of mine's movie that was made prior to this, but he's still sorting out um, his his premiere. Anyway, so once again, just a vampire culling through all the recent projects. But that's my right as the producer of these movies. I can sort of look through the, uh, the files at night. Um, but uh, Swanberg, I've been in his movies, and I called him. And, you know, it's a bit of an ask. These people have careers and things to do, and to just come and be in my film is always a little. But I kind of insist. Kevin Corrigan, I love. He's not going to show up. I had to kind of convince his agent. But... Uh, the weird thing, the nature of this film is that everybody was there for two days. It was so strange. And I like to speak of this movie as almost a, uh, an exercise in, in the art of acting because there's different styles. The guy with the goofy accent, the two asshole guys, uh, he's also from Jack's film. And uh, he just showed up with that accent and I was like, Okay, so we're going to draw it here, and then, you know, then, then Swanberg is pure mumblecore. He's the only guy who just didn't know the script, and he just sort of 
I mean, it's really interesting style of acting because I've acted in his movies. There's no script, and I hate improv because I'm like, what am I writing a script now? But he puts you in a place where you you feel very natural, and so and he's very good at that. And uh, I, I love what he. I mean, those are generally the lines, but he sort of took it somewhere else. So different acting styles. Of course, James Legro has been in some of my films. Barbara was so sweet uh, to show up. Uh, also inconvenient for her, but... Uh, and you co-starred with her. You did a film with her. Uh, yes, I've worked with Barbara a couple times. So we're, we're, we're pals, but it's still, you know, you still, hey, you want to come all the way to the East Coast and then drive upstate for a day? You know, there's no real glory in it, although I think everybody's so wonderful in their brief moment. And respecting the SAG strike, I'm just going to say there's a couple of actors who are here. We're not going to take our picture with them. We're not going to even talk about them, but I want to say I love them dearly, and thanks for being here. I'm talking to you, but I'm really talking to them. Thanks for being here to my few thespians. Why don't we give a round of applause? I think that. And I look forward to the end of this uh, nightmare strike, uh, which we need to do because we need to assert ourselves as independents and as artists against the greed mongers, but uh, I look forward to a real premiere where we can celebrate all the guys in front of the camera. These are the guys behind the camera. Uh, I want to close it on uh, the film's dedication to your father mm -hmm. and the relationship between fathers and sons, fathers and daughters, plays a significant part of the film. And for you, was this uh, an, an opportunity to either kind of exercise some demons or an opportunity to say goodbye or an opportunity to just sort of work some shit out? Talk a bit about that. Um, the reality is that all my films are about uh, fathers and sons in some way. The Frankenstein story is uh, actually in habit he's dealing with his father. So I think the way I see it is that the father figure and the patriarch, in fact, <laughs> is what comes before. And they lay out a set of principles and an example, and that's what the next generation has to deal with. So I th what I'm saying is this is an essential aspect of the human experience and so good fathers are important and bad fathers can ruin you look at Trump it's he had a bad father I think uh, I mean there's other things going on but that is one of them so uh, I do think these things uh, matter and they, they find their way into my movies I feel that all the principles of this of sort of the idea of kindness and gentleness now my dad wasn't a pushover but he was a, a kind person and so he died on New Year's Eve, and I was just finishing uh, the edit, and I thought, considering how much Alex Hurt and I had spoken about his father, who also passed during this production, it really is a movie about uh, dealing with the loss of your dad. So I, I put it on at the last minute. I was going to say for dads, like to sort of include him, and then I thought, look, this is just for my pop. Uh, so that's that's what it is. but. You know, his example, uh, now I'm getting all misty-eyed anyway. He was a good dude. Uh, he's gone. <laughs> all right, well, we got to wrap this up. But a uh, huge round of applause for Larry and Steve. <laughs> there is a second screening next week. Please spread the word. You're the first audience anywhere in the world to see the movie. Please start talking about it. Uh, it is eligible for our audience award. You see the QR code on the screen before the movies. Also, we have our opening night party at the SAC. Uh, it is open to all, so you're all welcome to be there. We hope to see you guys there. Larry, the next movie, the, 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 the dark universe, the, the bringing, your, bringing your monsters back. Please, 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 bring it to us. Yes, I've got to just quickly make it first. Well, that's <laughs> Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.